has been an Emic has been initiative and bio of orange culture and orange orange mentorship. Um, so lovely to have you guys. We just wanted to sort of have this conversation. It's supposed to be like a really relaxed um, conversation. We realize that we understand that in our ecosystem, there's a lot of stuff that I guess isn't in place. And we've realized that in the past few years, there's been a lot of work from designers such as yourselves, um, you know, trying to plug in the gaps, I guess, in the ecosystem. So I think for us, this was like, we thought it was an important time to sort of have this conversation. Um, yeah, we thought it was an important time to have this conversation and we really wanna hear some more about, you know, how you guys started this, you know, what you think, like an amazing, what you think like a good ecosystem would be um, in, like, in the fashion industry. So I, do, I guess I'm gonna start with Andrea. Um, you know, I, I'm sort of interested to see how you, to find out how you started and, you know, what sort of pushed you to launch uh, this year alongside all the other things that you do. Hello. Hello. Um, Deborah, you're breaking up really badly, so we can't really, really hear you. Can you. Oh, you can you hear me now? Yes, but you're yeah. breaking up not clear. Okay, let's try this again. Did you you missed my intro completely? Oh, wow. Basically, <laughs> right? Hello. Yeah, it's definitely your internet. Here, Andrea and Emmy very clearly. I see them very clearly, but you're freezing. Yeah. Let me just give me one second. Let me try something else. Can you hear me better now? I think so. I'm um, keep talking. Okay. <laughs> I'm so. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so I was basically talking about how um, this No, we can't hear. Oh my god. Okay. Oh, we can't hear. It's breaking okay. up again. Okay. Let me try and fix this again. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, we're here. You can hear me? Oh, it's still yes. Um, Bio, can you hear? I can hear you. It's more when you, let's, let's hear you talk oh. more. Just maybe say something longer so we can. Um, okay, so yeah, so I was so, so sorry about this, everyone. Um, so I was just introducing the panel. I said, when we were thinking about FBS this year, we realized that in the past few years, designers have sort of like taken a new role, apart from all the work that they do designing to sort of plug in gaps, I guess, in our growing ecosystem that we currently don't have. Um, and we thought that three of you are amazing because you're both doing amazing in design, but then you've also sort of started doing other things, initiatives that sort of give back to the community and give back to young people, um, which is why we thought we would do this panel. So I just wanted to find out um, a little bit of an intro, oh my God, a little bit of an intro on, you know, how you, how you started. Um, so Andrea, do you want to sort of take us through how you started? Um, design, we were a bit, we're, we kind of know about design, but design and then how it morphed into what you're doing now with all your other businesses. Um, oh, do you mean other businesses or just seed ambition? Just seed ambition. Okay. Mostly. <laughs> okay, okay, great. I mean, I've, I've been in design and fashion for a number of years now. Um, I think it, came as a reason for a couple of things. The first one was um, demand. I felt like it was one of the most popular things that I was um, constantly asked for in terms of just um, advice and, you know, just how to get around starting something, growing something. Um, and I just was unable to attend to every single request I would get. Um, so I wanted to, I'm a very structured person. So I think I wanted a system as to how I could do that without it always being one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, so that was the reason why 
So one was demand. I felt like it was very requested. Um, I didn't even see the need of it at first. So the more I got requests for it on how to, there was just a lot of how to's. Um, I also didn't feel like I was ready um, at the time. So the second reason was experience. Um, not that I'm even at the top of experience now, but I felt like in order to feel confident about what I would tell people that I needed to experience what I was teaching um, or what I was um, educating people about. So it then came about after um, nine to 10 years being in, in the industry, um, I think lockdown kicked in that energy to be able to say, okay, I'm just gonna try it. So I tried the first virtual one, which is a masterclass. Um, so seed ambition in general was just set up and designed to encourage building other African specifically, I mean, it's around the world, but specifically African or um, black creatives and as to how to maneuver building creative businesses. So it's not just fashion, it's artist, um, anything along the arts industry where there's very little structure or resources that actually shows you how to do things um, while you know other industries are quite developed in in those areas so yeah that was it and i think you, you set up a goal financially as a business and you say okay once i hit this goal and then you hit that goal and it doesn't feel as fulfilling so i think that once we hit revenue goals or whatever the case may be i feel like there should be more brands that should be able to do this so it just basically gave me more meaning as to why I'm a designer, um, because you, you can grow your business all you want, but the real, the real soul is growing other businesses. Okay, thanks. Um, that's great, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, Bio, do you want to sort of talk about? Yes, that's right. That's it. Bio, do you want to talk about why? Sort of okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so thank you, Lagos Fashion Week, for having me. I'm honestly thankful and to be speaking alongside two of my friends and Hello? Oh, I was scared that that was me. Okay. Um, okay, I guess he'll, he'll, when he can reconnect, I mean, do you want to sort of speak about Emika's, which you just launched, I think is super exciting. So do you want to sort of talk us through like why and why now as well? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Lagos Fashion Week, for this opportunity. Um, as we all know, Emikazbe is the DNA. When you mention Emikazbe, the first thing that comes to mind or the first word is probably sustainability, equity. And yeah, equity is a textile we work with for at least 90% of our collection. So we've been doing this for about a couple of years now. I've been designing for about eight years, but I started working with equity like five years ago. And Honestly, we've seen the impact that it has brought to the community and the particular women we work with. So the initiative was launched to sort of like give back to this community because it's, it's almost like when you talk about sustainability, you know, you're taking from this community and the women are now seen as the breadwinners of the family. You know, we live in a system whereby men are always meant to be like the people sort of like bringing the money to the family. But now in this community, the women are not, the men are not the ones doing the weaving because it's a taboo according to their tradition. Now the women are the only ones doing it. So this initiative was launched to sort of like give back, give back to these women and also help them to bring this craft to the center stage. Because when we started working with the equity, the, the craft was almost extinct, but now, there's a lot of buzz surrounding this craft, this textile, and we want to sort of like help them. And also we plan to, for the Kazit initiative, we're focused on, you know, poverty eradication, cultural liberty enhancement, and cultural education. So these are some of the things we want to help with. And we plan to achieve this through specially curated 
probably is like summer camps for girls or young girls to go and learn with the women, train for about a couple of months, and also now come back to maybe work for us. Perfect. Thank you so much, Emmy. Bye, <laughs> You're back. Can we? So, do you sort of want to talk about, you know, why you started um, Orange Mentorship and, you know, what sort of, I guess, gave birth to that? And, like, also, why now? Because it's also quite, it's, it's been a while, but it's also quite fresh as well. Mm. So, um, I've been doing Orange Mentorship for a few years um, already. It first started off being physical sessions a few years back i think about five five years ago yeah so we started off with physical sessions and basically orange mentorship started off as a support system for designers like myself who for example when i started off didn't have access to sort of like fashion schools or didn't have access to mentorship programs or didn't have access to men mentors people who they felt like they wanted to be like but didn't have access to maybe getting information from them or talking to them or even just general access to children. It's basically just a platform to create knowledge or to give access to knowledge and create awareness for designers who are trying to build a brand for themselves. Because the problem is, you know, not everyone in Nigeria has access to education, especially when it comes to fashion. Because if you think about the fashion education is really almost non-existent within the country and, and not everyone can go to you know csm or go to L london college of fashion not everyone can afford to and so how then do people learn you know there's so much that you can gain from youtube but there's also the blessing of learning from someone who has experienced the industry and that's what orange mentorship basically gives you we've had and because we've had andrea and Yama, we've had many other people from retail distributors to photographers to writers to fashion designs, we've had Mrs. Akirade as well. We've had many people who have been able to teach our upcoming designers many, many things, you know, um, and give them many ways to also build their own brands as well. Um, aside from that, we've also ventured into creating opportunities for people to gain, um, to gain access to employment opportunities within the fashion supply chain as well, from um, working for fashion designers to working for stores to working for, um, for writers, for, um, for the media, you know. So we're basically expanding from not just being a knowledge, a base for knowledge transfer, but also being a base to sort of help, um, sort of put numbers within the supply chain of the fashion industry as well. Um, we also had a competition as well, which helps support young designers getting into retail as well, um, which we are continuing again, even this year as well. But I think what made it really, um, sort of hits people was actually during the lockdown. Um, when the lockdown started, we took it from being a physical session to a virtual session. And we gave people access to these virtual sessions for free. And people spoke to so many designers who they would never have met or had access to. Or finally had access to ask all the questions that they wanted to ask and hear their stories. And I think one of the things that you realize that as a fashion designer, a lot of the time, especially when you're Nigerian, we learn a lot from just doing it. We don't really gain like, we don't really have like a textbook, um, textbook that tells us how to run a fashion brand within our own country and our own continent, which is an entirely different thing from running a fashion brand in Europe or in America. It's a very different sort of space. And so having the ability to ask people and say, hi, how do I do this? Where do I get this knowledge? How do I build it? How do I access tailors? Orange Mentorship basically gives people that access and allows them to have the support system that maybe we didn't have when we were growing up so that they can be better off than we were. Thank you, Bayo. Um, thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Emmy, as well. I think, you know, from listening to three of you, it's it's obvious that there's there's a lot that is, that is missing um, in our industry in terms of like education, support, you know, just mentorship, that sort of thing. I think, um, and it's fantastic that you're sort of trying to plug these holes. Um, but I think another question would be, and I sort of want this to be as conversative as possible, but how would you describe, uh, how would you describe a perfectly functioning fashion ecosystem? Like in Nigeria, how would you, what would, what would you like to see? And also, I guess, I just want us to sort of discuss like, you know, what the problems are and, you know, 
how does how does your work also i guess answer those in that sense by sort of you sort of touched on this but i think there's like there's more to sort of talk about but do you want to go first i did not hear you get uh, it, it tripped again. Okay. So the question was, how would you describe a perfectly functioning ecosystem? So what are the sort of things that you would like to see um, in the industry? Um, so you've sort of spoken about that, but like, what else do we want to discuss that, you know, is what, what else is there space for, I guess, in terms of like our ecosystem and like, you know, talking about how we build the future of the industry? Yeah, I get you. I mean, I think I think education is definitely key. I think everyone will agree. Andrea, Emmy, I think will agree. If yeah. the education, can you guys hear me properly? Yeah. So I think fashion education is a big thing that we actually sort out within the industry because I feel like a lot of our issues that we face in the fashion industry actually start from education because we don't have the know-how or the technical know-how. We don't have the research. We don't have the 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 corrective measures to sort of help us build successful brands or even brands that because i think another main issue for african brands is that you know we have a lot of creative designers a lot of talented designers but a lot of businesses aren't being built to sustain aren't being built to last decades and to outlive their owners or their starters you know we're not building brands that you know will live 100 200 years because we don't necessarily have those kind of brands or the infrastructure to build those kind of brands. And then from education, we go into infrastructure because I think fashion, culture, but definitely has a lacking within the infrastructure base as well. Um, when it comes to our supply chain, is allowing our system grow properly, if that makes any sense. Um, and I think that we definitely need to facilitate a healthier infrastructure and a healthier supply chain within the ecosystem. But I think I'll leave Emmy and Andrea to continue from there. Emmy, do you want to go? Yeah, so in my case, I mean, coming from a sustainable approach, of the thing, how, how much of the things we consume just in order to produce whatever we do. And then give, give an example of people who work with wool and then you require like the sheep. How many more sheep are going to, are we going to sort of like kill in order to produce what we need to produce? So now it comes to the, that is when you talk about giving back. What are you now giving back to community? Are you going to keep taking, taking, taking? So that's where our Emikazi initiative comes in. So look at the artisans, these women stay complaining of either their back pain or ways, and you know that there's no technology involved in this whatsoever. So it's our own opportunity to also make them feel loved. You know, give an example of the year two, maybe three years ago for the Laser Fashion Week campaign, where the women, the artisans were featured as, you know, one in, so it, took, it was a thing of joy because I actually like framed those photos to go to their houses and give, give them. In fact, one of them told me, oh my God, that she heard that, you know, she was on TV. I was like, oh yeah, this is the photo. So whenever I visit her, you see like the frame of the campaign in the house. So it gives me a bit of joy. So, so talking about a, a functioning ecosystem is where everyone is, you know, the, from the supply chain, everybody is like accredited to whatever they do. So no one is left behind. Fantastic, thank you so much, Emmy. Andrea, what are your thoughts on what a, a functioning ecosystem would be here? You're on mute. Thank you. So yes, I think Baya definitely, um, summed it up i mean the supply chain is and supply chain starts from the design phase to the production to the distribution um i think what we do not lack at all is creativity um we have a lot of fantastic design i think we have too much creativity you have some countries that don't have a lot of good designers but have very good manufacturers um so in those kind of countries they have more invitation but i think we have because as much as we say what we need, I, I'm going to highlight what we really have, where 
there's just so much creativity here. Um, I find that the two areas is, uh, I guess, buy really summed it up for the most part, but I would say probably the market in terms of the market being receptive to brands um, because you can create all you want. So if the market, if the product is in a market that doesn't want the product or doesn't see the products as valuable, um, then that's a bit more difficult um, to convince. Um, so that's, that's one and the market being accepting of it is marketing things in a way from our campaigns to accessibility to price point to understanding how to communicate your value whatever price point you've decided to put um, on your products. I don't think there's anything like a price that is too low or a price that's too high. It's just about the amount of work that you're putting to convince your market um, as to why they should pay that. So um, that's one. And the second part is the funding. Um, I find that there's in the tech industry in Africa. It's like every second year, Um, these designers still have problems with supply. So I keep wondering, it's not really the platform that they need. Individual brands need to be funded. But I know that there's so much focus on the tech industry and what e-commerce is doing that we forget that these e-commerce platforms need designers to produce things. If those designers don't have funding, the e-commerce platforms would likely not be as successful if they are indeed depending on African designers. So you have designers that are barely able to scratch the surface of their own customers. They can't get enough sizes of, let's say, extra small to double XL, where it's like two or three pieces per size. And before you think about distributing to some other website and this website and that website. So I just feel like as much as there is a lot of funding being directed towards the tech industry, brands need to be funded individually in whatever scale or size that that may look like from entry level brands to big bigger more popular aged in the business brands where we need to be able to mass produce if we're not mass producing there's only so much there's only so much room you can grow if growth is your intention now not every business is trying to grow that some of them are trying to survive keep to their market really depends but I would say funding, um, and if it's a custom made or, or slow production type of business, they also still need funding as well. So I just feel like Africa right now, there's a boom in tech, and I just really want that attention to come to um, not just e-commerce platforms. It's, it, you know, it, it, there needs to be who's supplying the products to these platforms that keep selling you know, the home of African luxury to buy different brands. It's always a beautiful initiative, but I think that funding is, is something that I'm really passionate about um, for brands and just really trying to, you know, tell investors that th there's also attention here where we need to put attention into, into um, multiple brands. And, and then from there, if you fund the platforms, then they can easily supply the platforms because the platforms only really make a percentage of the products from the designer. They don't actually make the crop of, of the profits. So yeah, those, those would be my two areas, the market and, um, and the funding, which obviously is in addition to supply chain. But creativity, we have a lot of that. I think it's structuring it, educational, like Bio has said, if we don't structure it, it's just gonna keep, it's just gonna be like a wild bush. Nothing is really tamed and, and really communicating something clear. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think you're absolutely right. And you know, all of you are actually right. There's so many things that I guess we're missing in our ecosystem from training to funding to market to value, even up to like professionals or just having a having a broader view of like what the fashion industry actually is. I guess that that's why you all do what you do, right? It's, it, it sort of then shows that yes, you're a designer, but then there's also so much other stuff that happens behind it or that supports it that allows you to sort of function in the way you do as a designer. Um, I think let's talk about challenges um, because of course, you know, some no good things come up without challenges. So I think 
it'd be great to know like what the challenges have been so far um, with you know your initiatives and your sister businesses and your platforms. Like what what have the what have the challenges been? You know, with like seed ambition, Andrea, do you want to sort of tell us what the challenges have been for you? Um, challenge time, time. So what I find is that um, it's 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 definitely demanding in terms of um, finding the time to be able to do it how you want to do it. I mean, you can do something again. Yeah, there's so myself and the team, like we're trying to put together our first masterclass, and it's either you're crunched because of all the stuff you have to do. So I would say. And um, being able to manage the priority of the importance of that just as much as the rest of your business is just as important. Um, especially because um, initiatives like this, your goal is not very, it's not, not, it's not even profit driven. Like you hope to make something while you're teaching, but the core is really the value of what you're teaching and the resources you're providing. So um, sometimes I also have to pull the team from other areas to assist with this area. So. It's, um, it's very time consuming, to be honest, um, but then that's why you have to do it for more than, it, it has to be something you do from your heart. I think that would be the first part. Um, the second part as well is still going back to this funding thing. When you're looking for sponsorship for things like masterclasses and stuff like that, um, when you talk about the creative industry, I feel like the, the conversation is longer because the things I do a bunch of other things. And I find that when you're trying to raise sponsorship for, other things, it's, 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 conversations are quicker, but with things like this, it, it's creative industry training is a bit slower. I think that people don't see it as lucrative, which is so ironic because I think fashion is, is not a developing industry in Nigeria, at least I don't think so and in Africa, like we're very fashion driven. It's not like people don't style hair, but yet it's so underdeveloped. It's so pop popular, but yet so underdeveloped. So when you're trying to communicate to people, okay, we're trying to raise funds to give back, or we're trying, you basically have to self-fund. So even the first grants that we're giving out had to come from the brand and come from us saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. So I think that if designers want to start things like this, they have to actually dedicate their own resources, their own time, their own money, um, or a bit before people start to kind of see what you're trying to do. Um, and then start to hang on to it and be like, okay, this is what. So if anyone's going to do it, I'm going to say the challenge is one, the time, two, the resources will come from you um, for the most part. So you have to just plug it into the system of your business. That, okay, every quarter we give whatever percentage back to, but or once a year we do this. So however you want to do it, um, you know, it's, it's something that we had to do internally with the company and be like, okay, we give a certain percentage at the end of the year or certain amounts, or we get do some research and find out what are people's pain points um, and find a way to sort out, okay, they need a sewing machine, let's get that for them, or they need it. And it has to be really you, but the truth is there's only so far you can go with just you. You need more, more people. Um, but so far we've, we've been getting support slowly, but surely, but I think that, would, that that's the challenge I can think of off the top of my head. Um, just a follow-up question, actually. So how do you measure impact? I'm going to ask everybody this as well. But how do you now, we've spoken about funding, so how do you measure in, the impact? Of impact the, of funding specifically or just impact of the general? Impact of the work. <laughs> impact of, because uh, you need to measure impacts, get funding. So how do you measure the impact of yeah. I was a, it was a question. So like, how do you, so like, I guess, how do you measure it? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, so yes, I think I heard how do you measure impact. It yeah, dragged so a bit, you, but I think yeah, that was the general you, idea. Yeah, no, no, so how do you measure impact? It's, it's subjective as well. Um, okay, so I think it, so impact again has, you have to think about what the source of the resource was first, because there's different ways to measure different things. So for example, if you're talking about funding, um, how that would be, for example, is you want to check in on the person you, you funded and just check in, okay, what did this influence? This would be more of a one-on-one, -on -one, um, how this affected whatever they were able to do. This is on a money perspective. Now, if you're giving resources like Bio said, like connecting um, 
human resources to brands, um, then you want to check what are the number of the people that we've employed or assisted companies to to employ. Um, so you're really also working with stats, numbers, just, um, and then you go down to what is your reach in terms of your articles or, cause we do different types of resources. There's, um, there's funding, there's masterclasses, there's articles that we, we put in weekly. And then you, how, what are the views of your article? So every week we send out um, letters that are resources to help people. Um, okay, five things you need to think about with your pricing. All these things, we send it weekly and we check, are these views growing? Are people interacting with them? Are they giving feedback? Um, so th this is how you measure impact where there's obviously immediate responses like reactions to what you're doing. Um, and also social media, again, with initiatives and educational things, it's not glamorous and fancy. So people are not going to catch on to it like you're dancing in TikTok videos. But what you want to check is things like sales. So how many people are saving the, the content? Because on see that mission, we check, okay, are people saving? Are people interacting with it? They might not comment on that and have a fun time, but you can check that people do need it. Um, I think these are just a different way. So depending on what, I guess, um, mode of communication that is, there's different ways to measure that. Like, if we're doing our first masterclass, how many people attended? How many people came back for the next one? How many people are visiting your website? So um, really just looking at the stats. Um, and if it was five people last week, is it 20 people next week? Are people referring their friends? And when you, when you join Seed as a member, because we have the membership thing, we ask, where did you discover Seed from? Was it from a friend? Was it from social media? So this is how we measure things really. It's really how we measure impact with any other business. What is your growth rate? What is the number ETC? Um, so yeah, and I think with grants as well, you can't control what people do with the money really because it is a grant. I mean, if you needed money and you wanted to squander it, that is completely up to you. But you as the organization have kind of done your part and you can only check in. That's the truth. You can only check in and say, did, how was this effective? Was it enough? If you were to do this again, did we do something right? Did we do something wrong? And yeah, so that's that's kind of the general idea. Fantastic. So Emmy, over to you. What would you say your challenges have been so far? And then obviously, like how would you how would you measure impact in like the work that you do? Okay, so I mean, we just launched the initiative, but overall one of the challenges, one of the main challenges we had is that a lot of people are now sort of like invested in this textile that we're producing. And then it was a thing of the demand outweighing the supply. And then we wanted to sort of like circumvent that. How do we find, how do we find the permanent solution to this? How many artisans do we want to have that work for us like personally and not the one that tomorrow she tells you, oh, she's working for someone else. So this initiative, one of the plans we have is to launch the Artisans Hub project where we have more artisans to work and, you know, just work for us day and night and also be the ones training like the younger girls that we're going to be sending for the summer camps. And at the end of the day, it all boils down to what we're doing for them because working with these artisans can be very hard <laughs> because today they're complaining, tomorrow they're doing this. So it's like, it's like a love-hate relationship. So we want to move past all that. And then the impact where I think we're working with numbers because what, like I said, one of the major projects we want to be doing is training the girls through summer camp where they go and learn with the artisans and come back to work with us. So you're now looking at how many people did we train in the first quarter? How many people did we train in the second quarter? And how many more women now have like permanent jobs? Because I visit the, the village and maybe I walk past a compound and two looms are there, but there's no one. And maybe I ask the question, why is this woman not working? And maybe her neighbor says, oh, she doesn't have a job or she doesn't have any rapper to produce. But now we're building, we're sort of like getting the artisans hub where we get 15, 20 women who are constantly weaving every day. And also we're trying, by so doing so, we're, we're stopping the problem of someone ordering a particular product and having to wait like two to three weeks to receive an order. So we're trying to 
level all that and then so we're working with numbers when it comes to impact how many people did we train and how many people are interested how did you hear about this and how many women now have like permanent jobs as well so yeah great thank you Amy. um by also what are the challenges that you faced um and i guess like how do you measure the impact with the work that you've done so far Um, so I think in terms of challenges, it depends on the aspect of what we're doing. I think for the mentorship programs, I think because we've sort of created a, a system where it's low cost, if that makes any sense. Um, so some of the challenges we face are more like, for example, getting the mentors to actually believe in the value of interacting with these mentees, because I think that's a big issue people don't really believe that they have the time or are willing to really interact and teach and i think that's a really sad thing that happens a lot of the time so people have knowledge and aren't willing to pass it on because maybe they see the young people as competition or they're afraid of only god knows what and i think that's been an issue that we faced for decades in the fashion industry in nigeria that fear everyone wants to hold their knowledge to themselves you know it's like it's my superpower I don't want to teach anybody else because it's me, me and me alone deserves to have that access to success. And so a lot of the time we have students who are, because we get every week students tell us, oh, I want to talk, I want to meet this designer, I want to learn from this person. But you talk to that person, the person is so apprehensive. Um, I don't know why, but you know, that's an issue that we face, getting access to mentors sometimes. Um, aside from that, all the other issues that I faced that I've been able to sort of handle for now, and um, so there's not, there's not really that much of an issue um, because it's, I made sure it was very low cost from the beginning. I made sure that I had partners. For example, we work with Mint. We have people who have partner with us to ensure that this is a very low risk. I mean, the worst you face is NEPA, <laughs> PHC in Nigeria, and things like bad internet. Um, you know, um, but I think that those are some of the issues with job creation or or rather connecting them, not you're connecting people with jobs. Um, I think some of the issues we face is, you know, I think as you, you realize that a lot of people aren't prepared to work, if that makes any sense, a lot of, when you try to connect people with the fashion, with fashion businesses or fashion companies, you realize that a lot of young people have actually don't take the fashion industry seriously and don't understand the importance of applying for a fashion job, if that makes any sense. And so we have a lot of people who want to work, but unfortunately do not have the skill sets or the knowledge to actually take on these jobs. So there's, there's a vacancy, there's a lot of vacancy, but then the people who fill those vacancies or who need to fill those vacancies don't seem to exist because they don't have the know-how to fill those vacancies. And so a lot of the time we have all these job offers, we have hundreds of people who want to apply, but unfortunately, they either apply wrong <laughs> because they don't have the knowledge or they don't read or they don't, you know, it's just a lot of things. And I realize that that's a big issue within the country. And that's why I said education is very key because a lot of the time we have people who are aspiring to have these careers and build their fashion brands, but unfortunately aren't putting, or rather don't have the access to the knowledge to be able to create these businesses or to be able to fill these vacancies to help other businesses succeed. And that we find is a really big issue, you know, matching young people with employable spaces. It's, it's a really big issue for us as well. Um, yeah, so that's an issue as well. Um, I think, yeah, I think these are the ones that come to the top of my head for now. I think, well, for the competition we did, um, the competition, it was kind of hard to get um, sponsorship for that, but, um, you know, it's something that now we have sponsorship offers coming about for the next one. So I think once you're able to show them that, you know, what you're doing, you know, is going to impact many lives, people are able to sort of like latch onto that as well. I think in terms of measuring impact, I think for job, for the, for job placements, we've been able to fill some jobs and that's been great, seeing that oh, people who actually are qualified are getting access to jobs. And it's so crazy because if you think about it, as a fashion person, when you want to find a job, where do you go to actually search for jobs? There's nowhere, you know what I mean? Like you're like, oh, I want to intern. Where do you go to intern? If you email designers, we, designers were really busy. We don't have time, <laughs> you know? So it's like, you know, so a lot of the time a designer wants to know that, oh, somebody that they can trust can refer somebody to them. That's easier for you to do. So Orange Manuscript sort of helps do that, I guess. And so 
knowing that we've gotten some amazing young people job placements, that's a big thing for us. And that's a, an impact that we can measure. Um, also seeing for Orange Masterchip, seeing how many people have been impacted from the skill acquisition session. We did a skill acquisition session uh, two, a few weeks ago with the macrame sessions. And we've had students who have actually gone on to follow up with the classes and who have made bags, who have made phone cases. And for us, that's something that like, is amazing because people have acquired a skill, you know, and that's something that we can actually see them do. You know what I mean? And some of them are even saying, oh, they want to work with the, with, um, with the, with, um, with the macrame, with the people who started the macrame classes. We want to work with them, want to follow up with them, want to also start our own businesses. We want to, you know, learn, learn further. We want to do, so that also allows us to know that that's an impact that we've created and allows us to see that, okay, these are people who really want to follow up with these classes. Um, and even just with the sessions, you know, you get feedback. People will tell you, I remember when we had um, Andrea's session, we had follow-up emails who people were telling us, oh my gosh, I learned this, I learned that, you know, this really helped me support my business. This really helped me believe in this. This really helped me see myself in, you know, that relatability, that, 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 that person, that allow, it almost allows you to see a possibility for a future that you never thought you could have because you see somebody else who has that thing that you desire. Seeing Amy doing all these things, it's like you're seeing people who, people like you, who look like you, who come from where you come from, who are building businesses that you also aspire to have. And so you see more people coming to you and saying, oh, I believe in this because I listened to this person talk about it, because I saw this person do this. And so that's, it might not be quantitative, but that's something that you know that from an emotional standpoint, you can actually see the impact in a sense, you know? I think those are some of the ways, aside from, you know, the things Andrea mentioned and Amy mentioned that I can actually think of as well as ways to measure impact. Great, thank you so much, Bio. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that, you know, all three of you touched on. And I think for me, one thing that I got from it is that all of you sort of have plans that, that sort of speak to longevity in terms of like your initiatives and in terms of like the industry. And I think that that's fantastic. Um, I know that for us at Lagos Fashion Week, something that's so big for us that we always have to do is collaborate. Um, so I guess my next question would be, how important is collaboration for you? Um, this will be my final question. And then if there's anyone that has any questions in the audience, please uh, raise your hand or just type it in and we'll, we'll do audience questions after. But I guess just to sort of close off, um, you know, before last thoughts, but how how important is collaboration to the work that you do? Um, how far have you gotten with it or how much are you struggling with it? If, if so, it'd be great to hear. Emmy, do you want to start? Emmy? Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, the question was, how, how important is collaboration to the work that you do? Oh, for me, I mean, looking at us working with the artisans now, we're collaborating with the artisans, and that also means that we're also helping them to showcase this craft. Because I feel like one man alone can't do, like looking at what we plan to achieve with the initiative, we can't do it alone. So we've collaborated with most people to actually start the process of the artisan hub. And then I feel like when you collaborate, it's all to, you know, to reach a certain goal. And if you have something in mind that you want to achieve, you just have to come together to achieve that purpose. Thank you. Andrea, how about you? You're on mute again. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, it's very important, especially because as we said, it, for the most part, it is give back. So, um, and there's only so much of yourself you can give or the quality of what you can give is so, so it's a bigger picture. Industries um, understand the importance of, of what you're doing and why it's also important to them as well, what value it brings to them. So we try to, um, every time we have speakers and this is something we call Creator Corner and that
because you're sharing your knowledge and it, it's really not a has to be yes like you have to be comfortable with it to do it well so um we've been very very blessed with people that are for the most part very um happy to teach and to teach by sharing their story so that's really what the creator corner is operative requirement because we really need them to work with us to be okay with sharing their story and we find these sessions to be very very helpful because it's not just the live sessions but after those sessions um the admin team kind of takes everything they've said and we cook it and we di dissect it and we spread on into like um articles so we bring out articles from whatever they said even things they haven't said and we just kind of so there's a different version. So it's really just a lot of resources for us to even bring about more resources. So it's not just interviews. We take out like a theme of what they've said and it builds the next theme. And then, so it just keeps on going like that. So collaboration, not just any knowledge, but it helps us know how to keep building the platform from the things we get from these creators that um, inspire the younger, younger upcoming or even established brands. Thank you. And bio. So I think um, for me, even from Orange Culture, I've always just believed in the power of collaboration. And I've always just believed in the power of uplifting each other um, with our various platforms and the power of also exchanging our knowledge and exchanging our skills, especially within our country and within our country, especially for an industry like ours that's so young. Um, there's so much that we do not have infrastructurally and in so many different facets. And I feel like the only way for us to actually build it, especially because we don't have the support of, you know, the larger bodies that may, you know, that other industries may have in their various countries or continents, because we do not have access to a lot of those things, maybe the resources that, for example, our government might have given us or whatever. Um, I think that because we don't have that, the only way that our industry can actually grow is if we collaborate, collaborate across the board, you know, from fashion designers to manufacturers, to photographers, to creators, whatever the case is, I feel like we can help each other out a lot more if we work together. And our industry will move a lot further, a lot faster if we actually work together and not against each other. And I think that that's really, the, that's really where the power of collaboration comes about. And I think that that's why platforms like this that are supporting designers coming together, speaking together, supporting each other, having things like woven threads happening, these platforms are allowing all of us to work together to build a better sort of, I guess, better future for our industry. And, you know, showing us that when we work together, we're a lot stronger and we're a lot more powerful. And I think that even from an onlooker from any other industry, looking at us from that light and seeing us coming together, it makes us look better. It makes us look more investable. It makes us look like an industry that can create a better financial sort of like reintroduction to the industry in a sense, you know, I think that that's really where collaboration comes about. Even for Orange Mentorship, I feel like we've really been thankful to have people work with us. We've been thankful to have speakers coming to speak with us and seeing the value of actually passing on knowledge. And I think that that's what makes it powerful because now we have designers, people in the industry who are seeing that, you know what, I've come as far as I've come, not because I had the support, but I'm not going to allow people who are coming after me go through the things I you to make sure that they have a better future than you is the strongest collaboration that we can ever have to build our industry even further. So I think that that's what makes it even more powerful. Fantastic, thanks so much. Um, I think personally as well, I, I don't know, Bio, do you remember, the, I think the very first conversation I had with Bio was when I was doing my um, master's dissertation and I was trying to find designers who were going to be open to talk about stuff and collaborate and all of these things. And I mean, you were one of the people that answered, which I think was amazing. So especially on what you're, talk what you're touching on right now, I mean, it, it did then create, you know, all this paperwork and all this research um, that, we, that wasn't there before. So I think you're absolutely right that, you know, collaboration, especially within the industry and across is so important, especially in the future of the industry. Um, I haven't gotten any questions yet, so I think to close off, because I don't want to do this for over an hour, um, I think to close off, I'd like to sort of know, where do you see your initiative in the next five, ten years? So what's next? What are the big plans? Um, Andrea, do you want to go first? 
Hi. Oh, wow. Um, I'm not always very good at answering future questions. Um, but I think right now, I, I like to, I don't have any set, I guess, define out of, of, of what would be looked at as the big goal. Um, so I'm a very process driven person. Goals are good, but I'm very process driven. So I feel like the um, our general intention of vision was to be able to say, okay, we have a million seed members. And what that means is that a million people that are registered, and that's supposed to be like a 10 to 20 year plan. Um, because to us, that was the number that kind of hit my spirit. It seemed extreme, but I was like, you know, it's not impossible. Um, and what those members really mean is people that have access to our resources in different ways. So that could be divided into 50,000 are in some scholarship and 10,000 are have been employed. Millions seems like a lot, but by the time we break it up into different specialty points, it didn't feel impossible. So it was just a million members for the sake of a million members, then it's it's big. But if you say, okay, we want to have 5,000 um, high school students that we do this with and 10,000 here. And this is, that's why I'm saying collaboration is so important because I don't know that we can do it on our own. Um, so that's the vision for us where um, beyond Nigeria, beyond that, Africa um, and really being able to say that okay maybe one day school I don't know but um, my friends tend to believe that my real calling is to to own a school which is funny but um, so maybe that maybe that would be it one day so when I'm older and I don't have energy to design anymore but um, yes yeah, so so it's really just the, the numbers is is key for us. Um, and then the quality of, of obviously what we're giving and um, being able to have specialization within those numbers. Um, maybe some could be um, creativity development, others could be production, others could be um, teaching. It's just different areas of specialty would be the dream um, ambition plan, seed ambition plan. Yeah. Fantastic, thanks so much. Emmy. <laughs> You're on mute. I mean, you're on mute. Um, I mean, the vision is to, you know, like create a hub in order to create a seamless environment for these artisans. So in the next few years, we want to have been able to train, you know, a couple of young girls to actually embrace this craft. And also, because I mean, we realize that these days a lot of people are invested in fast fashion. You know, things are moving too fast. And, and that will also, you know, bring me to the point of waste reduction. You know, want to be able to teach people to sort of like adopt slower methods of actually creating timeless pieces and thereby you actually, and also that, yeah, that touches on waste reduction. So we want to have been able to train these, a, a couple of young girls to go and learn this craft and also come back, yeah. Okay. That's great. Thanks so much, Emmy. And Bio, what's five to 10 years looking like? Um, so I think for me, five to 10 years, um, you know, I think for me, when I think about it, I think about most of for what I'm doing, um, because sometimes when I, like I always say when I started oil much, I really didn't think. I just thought about it from a sort of like emotional standpoint, like okay, this is what I want to do to support young people, because I'm a very emotional person. So I always think about this from an emotional standpoint, and then eventually I start thinking, oh, this is going beyond just me wanting to do it. Like now I have to actually structure my plans, which is what we're in the process of doing. Um, and I think for us, we really want to expand from doing you know, smaller classes to bigger classes, to going not just Nigeria, but actually having classes regionally um, in different parts of Nigeria to different parts of Africa, you know, and also sort of collaborating with more um, knowledge exchange platforms or programs, um, having, making our competition, I guess, giving people more access to funding through our competition as well, so increasing on that. Um, and just various things that help us really support the young designers that are coming up. We have a few things in, in the mix, but obviously we're still developing. So I guess as time goes, you'll find out. <laughs> but, but I think just the general knowledge is knowing that we're really just about supporting younger designers and looking for more avenues to do that. So I think within the next five to 10 years, we'd have had more structure and would have created more avenues to support our designers locally and give them access to more knowledge. 
Lovely. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so I guess to close out, I guess there's been a lot of learning and I think, you know, all the work that three of you do is super important. I mean, there's there's still so much more ground to cover, but I think it's it's great that, you know, you've, you've all taken it upon yourselves, even with how busy you are, to do something else to give back um, and looking at the longevity of the industry. Um, I really applaud you because obviously, as Andrea said, there's not enough time, so I don't know how you find the time to do it. Um, but I think it's really fantastic and it's great to see designers sort of stepping out and doing that. And, you know, more power to you. We'll support in any way that we can. Um, we're really behind you and we think that is so important and so great that you're doing this. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for everyone that like was in part of the audience and, you know, listened to the whole conversation. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Emmy. Thank you, Bio, for taking the time out um, to speak with me today. Thank you for being patient. <laughs> um, yeah, and just have a great weekend. But thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, I love that.